Hello, everybody. Uh, another Q&A video coming at you hot. This time we have a very special guest, uh, Carl from InRange TV. Now, this is perhaps the most requested collaboration that uh, I've ever had uh, for my channel with any other YouTuber. Lots of uh, crossover between our audiences. And uh, we're just going to shoot the shit and take some uh, Patreon questions. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Uh, I think it's great. I really love what you're doing with your channel. I love your your uh, your your work and the historical elements, which I think is sorely needed in the community. And uh, the crossover is awesome. So I think this is going to be great. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on the program. Um, let's, uh, uh, yeah, I'll just dive right into the questions here, I guess. Here's a question about New Orleans. The city seemed to have had a weird habit of keeping types of people around who had long since died out. Uh, piracy was basically a thing of the past in the 1800s. And yet uh, here in the city, we had uh, Jean Lafitte in the early 19th century. High society serial killers were all gone by the beginning of the 19th century, yet we had Delphine LaLaurie, famous serial killer. Uh, they made a TV show about her. What is it about New Orleans that attracts relics of times past? It's a bit of a, uh, bit of a philosophical question, though I, I guess it kind of dips into the cultural. What do you think, Carl? Well, I mean, you're the, you're the New Orleanian local. I'm the one that visits regularly, so you might have better perspective on this than I, but in, in my work there and in my enjoying the community and everything that New Orleans has to offer, I think that it's a place that has that seems to maintain a better connection with its roots than anywhere else I've been in the U.S. And I know we have a lot of communities that have deep roots, but New Orleans roots mm. are deeper. I don't know how to describe it other than when you're there, it's palpable. It's like the history is still alive in a way. It's it's almost in the air, just like the humidity. It's it's, um, And as a result, I think that some of the legacy of the past just continues to maintain into the future. Some of it very good, some of it not good, but I think that's what makes mm. it such a special place. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there is uh, there is kind of an aspect of the city where it's it's like, you know, 10 or 20 years behind the rest of the country. You know, I always uh, marvel at friends of mine who live like out in California, you know, and they've got like jet, jet packs in their toilets. You know, their, their technology is just like insane. Mm -hmm. Just their day to day stuff. You know, they've got fucking... I don't know, but they've got fucking robot bus drivers or some shit over there. But like that whole Silicon Valley world just seems so total recall to me. Um, you know, we've still got fucking streetcars, you know, <laughs> like um, uh, there's, uh, you know, motor transportation that, that peaked in the 40s. And I mean, you know, there was a six month period where I would take the streetcar every day to work. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, obviously a lot of our infrastructure has, uh, you know, a lot to be desired. I mean, shit, the pumps that's, uh, that, 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 you know, help us stay dry during floods, you know, that they haven't been changed since World War I. Uh, so there is sort of this uh, uh, very kind of old timing kind of aspect to it, which, you know, obviously in terms of infrastructure and in terms of like making people's lives a bit better could use an update, but, you know, there is sort of a, uh, a, a bit of a sort of poetic hipstery sort of aspect to it that that I like, at least in theory. You know, it's sort of in practice it can get a little frustrating sometimes. But uh um but yeah there there is sort of an aspect of it like that. I mean, you know, when you look at so much of the history and so much of the culture, uh, you know, particularly the black culture of New Orleans, and you look at uh jazz and the legacy of certain aspects of slavery, you know, um and uh and 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 especially like the food, you know, I mean that's kind of a you know and that's and it's in all like the tourism videos. It, it is a bit of a cliche, but it's true. I mean, like in the food, you know, yeah, all those fucking tourism videos. So, you know, the food is the culture of the city. And, you know, they'll fucking have, you know, oh, it's a, the city is a gumbo. Just like, <laughs> but it's true. No, you it know, really is true. When you're like, there, it's legit. That is that, that while it is absolutely an advertisement, the food, the, the, mm -hmm. The differences in the in the cooking and the food and the culture is represented there. You can taste it. It yeah. really is real. It's not. That's not bogus. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You know, you've got sort of the. You know. Yeah. You have like. Uh, uh, you know, you have French cuisine. You have elements of Spanish cuisine and like West African, you know, cuisine, and all this sort of stuff. And then you know, kind of like your sort of uh, uh, even kind of, you know, river boats, you know, Kentucky type of, you know, uh, cuisine that all sort of blends together. And, 
There is, uh, yeah, like you said, it is very much kind of a living, breathing thing here. When you're talking about the history and how it seeps into the culture and makes it a thing and why it's still there is like one of the ones that really struck me. And it's, it, it is, it's something that came from something so horrible, but through the crucible, we now have this, this at least cultural identity of food that's just wonderful, such as gumbo, right? Gumbo being, I, I guess, a word for okra. And the original okra, as I understand it, got to New Orleans because, sadly, people who were taken, being taken away from their homes to be forced into transatlantic slavery had some of the women weave the seeds into their hair so they would have some touchstone of their culture and history and food and lifestyle with them when they got to wherever they were landing up if they survived. Those were planted, turned into okra, which then is now a you know, quintessential part of New Orleanian cooking and gumbo. And so there's a terrible story and a terrible origin that through the crucible has turned into this very amazing cultural thing, but it's got a sad beginning. A lot of, you know, kind of what we think of as like American cuisine uh, was originally black cuisine. Mm -hmm. And originally, you know, during slavery days, it was the awful that the masters would just kind of throw, you know, it was the leftovers, you know, it was, um, you know, pig's feet and stuff like that. And over generations, they just learned how to fucking make pig, pig's feet taste really good, you know, and, that, and you know, and then it's, it's and yeah, that's just sort of, you know, they kind of, uh, uh, yeah, they just sort of learned and over generations that just becomes kind of part of like the culture. It's not just in the, um, in, in African-American culture here either. I mean, there's, uh, um, you know, I mean, shit, you know, the Irish Channel, you know, you have uh, so many waves of the Italian immigrants. I mean, that's sort of one aspect of New Orleans history that's gone so uh, overlooked, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, is that you have... Uh, um, you know, on Carrollton, on North Carrollton Avenue, you got the uh, uh, Angela Bricado, which is, you know, like the Italian, this the, the cannoli shop. And it's like the best cannolis you've ever fucking oh, had. It, it's been they're there amazing. For years. I vouch for that. They're amazing. You know? <laughs> yeah. And also that kind of affected the the accents of like white residents of the city, too. You know, because you had, you know, you sort of listened to a lot of the sort of old timers uh, uh, in New Orleans. And, you know, fuck, they sound like they're from fucking Brooklyn, you know? They've got, like, this very sort of northeast, you know, sort of city, kind of kind of Mediterranean descendant kind of accent. It's really, really odd. But, I mean, it's just kind of, you know, and, and that and, you know, and that kind of bizarrely sort of mixed with, like, the black Louisiana accent. And it's just, it's just bizarre. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it really kind of is, uh, I mean, I've certainly never lived anywhere that where the sort of, the, the, the true kind of American melting pot was like quite so apparent. Um, and, you know, I could talk about this for a long time. Oh, so could I, honestly, I love it. I love hearing it because I yeah. love the city. I, I can tell you do. And I, I wish, I wish I was there more than I am for quite, quite honestly with COVID right now, it's been more difficult, mm -hmm. but one of the most, um, prominent experiences in my memory of seeing how, how much the food and the culture is a living thing there was, um, there's a, yeah. there's a, sort of Vietnamese influenced shop called Mofo. Have you been yeah, to Mofo? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yep. yep. And uh, yep. so the Vietnamese community is having a lot of influence in like in, in, in East New Orleans and into the community now. And it's mm -hmm. becoming, it's yeah, always living yeah. and changing and dynamic, but it still maintains a touchstone to the past. And one day I was at Mofo and I had the red beans and rice, but it was done mm -hmm. Vietnamese style. Like they were little fried yeah. rice cubes and there was all spice in it, but it still had that, that New Orleans flavor. It was exactly the thing that's gone on for hundreds of years in that city. And that was a simple example yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, the Bon Mies and stuff. There's a great place on a canal called, called Eat Well, you know, uh, that, where you can get like, you know, 12 inch po', po boy for like four bucks, you know, and, and yeah, it's the, the done completely with the Vietnamese style. And yeah, that's sort of, uh, and that's another interesting, there's another interesting aspect of that too. And uh, which I, I admittedly don't know like a, a huge amount, but from what I understand, it's a lot of, uh, it's mainly South Vietnamese immigrants who came to Louisiana hmm. and, uh, and they were initially attracted to the climate because it's very similar to South Vietnam. Um, and, you know, also that, uh, um, you know, kind of the, the, the fishing economy, you know, the shrimping and the, the crawfish and stuff. And, you know, and, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, Vietnamese like fishermen, you know, um, and that's kind of cool as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's, let's move on to the yeah, next question that's here. That's the question. There are, we there are more New Orleans whole, questions. We could have done the whole Q&A on that one question. Okay. So if you could go back in time to observe, but not interfere in one historic event, what would you choose? Mine's super cliche, I have to admit, based on content on my channel. I would want to be able to observe yeah. and not get hit by a bullet 
in the street fight on Fremont in New or- in uh, in Tombstone. So the you know traditionally referred mm. to as the gunfight at the OK Corral. There are so many yeah. different opinions about what happened and like eyewitnesses that have conflicting opinions and so all the things that happen in 30 seconds of conflict. But being able to be mm. there on Fremont Street and see it happen and actually try and ascertain who really did what and who said what and who drew first yeah. to determine who was on the right or wrong side if there was one in that altercation and that while that's just a gunfight one of there's a quote here in Arizona from one of our lawmakers that all law in Arizona starts and ends with the OK Corral and there's a certain amount of truth to that and seeing that actually event and how it really shaped the future of not only this state but western understanding and even Western law and the old West turning into the new West would be something I'd want to see. You know more about this uh, than I do, Carl, but I mean, I'm sure there must have been some, you know, uh, dramatic, you know, courtroom sort of there's some trials or something that like sort of where some lawyers tried to argue kind of this way or that, right? Well, there were the Spicer hearings, which were, they were using to determine if there should be criminal charges placed against the Earp Party. Mm. And uh, it's very interesting in that Judge Spicer had previously experienced the uh, issue of jury nullification when he was ruling, uh, when he was a judge up in Utah with, with the Mormon community, specifically the Mountain mm. Meadows Massacre. And that re- re- uh, essentially resonated in his mind during the Spicer hearings uh, regarding the OK Corral gunfight. And he felt that the ERP party would not be able to face a reasonable um, jury. And so with that in the back of his mind, he determined that they had acted um, imprudently, but not illegally and did not press charges. Hmm. So it didn't turn into an actual criminal hearing as a result. It was just these a hmm. criminal trial, excuse me. It was just a hearing of whether there should be one. And so it's very interesting to see that there was even, you know, a fractionalization and this historical um, input from the judge having experiences in the past with other similar circumstances deciding to be like, mm, we're just going to call it a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised that nobody's made like at least a bad movie about that hearing. I mean, there's, you know, there's so many movies about OK Corral. I mean, there's like my, my favorite is probably uh, My Darling Clementine, um, uh, for the one from the 40s. Um, and, um, you know, Tombstone, you know, the, and then there was whatever the, the Kirk Douglas one, uh, one was, uh, Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster. Um, uh, you know, that with the, with the ridiculous 50s, you know, theme song, was, you know, mighty cold, mighty cold, mighty cold or whatever. Okay, corral. <laughs> <laughs> with a gunfight um, that goes on but, for like uh, 10 minutes or whatever, right? Which the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. 30 yeah. seconds. But yes. And they're taking cover and stuff yeah. and, you know, having dialogue scenes. Um, I yeah, agree. Exactly. It'd be really interesting to see um, that actually all of the, the actual hearing, the actual Spicer hearings are all documented. All the notes, nothing's been mm. lost. Um, what's really funny, though, about just a, a little bit about the reality of the city of Tombstone. Years and years yeah. ago, there was a woman there, uh, Nancy Sosa, who was trying to be to do something about the preservation of the archives. And she had gone down mm. underneath the original city hall, which is still there to this day. And underneath a bunch of blue tarps with water on it and water stains were all the original documents with Earp's signatures. And oh, everything. wow. Yep. And so she took them oh, out of there and tried to awesome. put them into a house and do proper archivism and like protect the documents. And Tombstone decided yeah. it was too expensive. So I believe that stuff's back under a blue tarp. Oh, man. Kind of wild. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, that's just, you know, that's that's some, you know, grad student is like, needs to fucking get on that shit and write a book, you know? <laughs> the budget has to go to getting the tourists and not archivism of documents yeah. under a blue tarp yeah. in the city hall. No, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and yeah, exactly. Like suckers like me who, uh, who go to Tombstone and say... I really need a, a, a high quality Stetson. <laughs> no. I did get this hat there, I have to admit. Um, oh, yeah, well, actually, uh, uh, it's a bit, a bit shameful, but um, this was uh, oh. this is the one that I got there. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. So, you know, I talked about my event. What's your event? I think I would want to go way back. I think I would want to go to, to, uh, to, to prehistory. Um, nothing sort of that crazy like you know the first time fire was artificially made or whatever i I would just kind of want to like you know just sort of see neanderthals burying a loved one or Mm -hmm. cooking some meat or uh you know or or just kind of follow around the first homo sapiens who you know entered into asia you know for a day and just kind of see what they were up to and just see sort of how they lived their lives um and I, I think that's kind of the, the sort of most uh, 
uh, that's the kind of thing that I would want, that I would do if I had a time machine, you know, is just kind of see just daily life, domestic, boring stuff, you know? I think ancient Egypt would be a really good one to see too. Like that's, um, like, like we don't, like we know, you know, we know a lot about kind of what ancient Egyptians, you know, ate and how they got their food. I mean, they were kind of a river people, right? So, you know, their whole lives centered around the river. And, um, but there's also kind of so much that we don't know about just kind of like, what were the daily like rituals, you know, of, of you know, I mean, obviously it's a, a highly, highly religious society. Um, but sort of how did that manifest in everyday life? You know, because with so many of these ancient cultures in particular, you know, we really just hear from the kings and the priests, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I would be kind of curious to see kind of, you know, what's the you know, the, a day in the life of a pyramid builder or, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, or even just a, a sort of ordinary city dweller. I mean, one of my favorite aspects of, of really ancient history to study, and I'm not an expert in it by any means, but, um, you know, I, I love looking at some of the first cuneiforms, you know, uh, cuneiforms, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but uh, that uh, were put down in ancient Sumer. And it's just the most mundane shit. You know, it's just like, contracts for <laughs> the sale of grain, you know, and, and it's people complaining about like this shipment was late, you know, it's just so mundane and so ordinary. And, uh, and, and I just love that, that idea that like, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, you kind of look at, at the, the you know, at a city dweller uh, today and sort of the stuff that they are involved in and the stuff that they're uh, uh, just th how their daily life, you know, if you live in New York city, you know, I'm now you got 7am, I catch the A train and I go uptown or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it wouldn't have been that like unbelievably different in like Ur or Thebes, you know, it's just like, you get up, you go to work, you do your thing, you know, you open up the shop, you know, it's, it's, you know, and, and I kind of, uh, you, you read a lot of this, this primary source stuff of people in the ancient world. Uh, running their businesses, uh, and, you know, and, and it just kind of, you know, when, when it really kind of, the more that, that I read those primary sources, the more it kind of grinds my gears, how a lot of people, especially kind of in the history nerd community, and some of them are kind of weird about it, like, you know, the grand old days, you know, and it's like, uh, okay. Uh, but there is sort of, you know, there is kind of the more hippy dippy kind of what I would consider more harmless element to it as well, which is sort of the, uh, um, uh, you know, oh, connection with nature, oh, who, you know, who, you, you know, that sort of aspect of it, which, you know, uh, um, our ancestors, you know, they knew how to identify a certain type of flower, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's, 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 it's not the... The element you know, of lost like, knowledge read that we've somehow become too technological, yeah. and they actually had the answers, yeah, and like, they lived for a thousand years, yeah, we precisely. just don't realize it. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Like, it's just, I, I don't, I don't buy that at all. Like, you read what these people actually put down, and they were just concerned with, you know, shit, when's my grain getting in? You know, it's like, it's not that different from being like, eh, that Amazon package was supposed to arrive at three, you know? It's, it's really not that different. It's like the um, graffiti in Pompeii for a good time call, right? Yeah, I mean, essentially, yes, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's ex that's the exact same thing, you know, where it's, you know, it's just the same thing that, you know, you uh, used to see in bathroom stalls. I don't know, I mean, you probably still do, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I feel like a lot of that bathroom stall, the, the art of the bathroom stall graffiti has kind of moved into the YouTube comment section, you know, uh, that, uh, yeah, you sort of, you know, it, it, the, the Hagia Sophia, some Viking was writing stuff like, you know, uh, I fuck pussies, you know, and then and now it's, you know, and then it was in a bathroom stall in Central Park and now it's in my YouTube comment section, you know, it's just the same shit, same shit, different day. Um, but, uh, but I love that. I love that because it like, because it makes me feel uh, really quite connected to the people in the past. When you speak of primary sources, I do. A lot, I'm so interested in Old West stuff. But there are two really interesting mm -hmm. primary sources of like the region I'm in here, southeastern Arizona. There is a there is the, the the Parsons Diaries, which was a man who lived in Tombstone, and he wrote a very extensive, very very specific um, account of multiple things that happened down there. And for whatever reason, his yeah. is like this very interestingly historically focused thing. But then you go to George Hand, who was a saloon keeper here in Tucson, and his George Hand saloon diaries are exactly what you're describing. It is literally the day in, day out of getting up, opening the saloon, 
Yeah. Uh, when he had to go to the bathroom, his stomach hurts, and what prostitute he had sex with that week. That's it. It's the whole book. <laughs> yeah, of course, like yeah. the whole book. That's all it is. It's extremely boring to read. By the time you get done with it, you're like, "Wow, all right, that was a pretty mundane existence." But it really does give you an idea of the reality that most people have. Things haven't changed much. People are people, and life is life. All right. So this next one is: What is an aspect of New Orleans history that ought to be studied more? Um, should we uh, have, have, have we? And actually, the next question is a New Orleans one as well. Um, I mean, I don't know. Do, do you have an answer for this? Uh, we kind of addressed this. Already. I think we've addressed that one quite a bit, quite honestly. This, I mean, I, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I, I, the only thing I would say to that is that I've I, I, I've noticed in my last time there, which has been a little longer than I like because of COVID, that some of the historical yeah. markers, well, a lot of those mon monuments that you have a video about, which is excellent, are gone. Quite thankfully, I will say, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but at agree. the same time, there's some new ones that have popped up that are actually trying to be a little more honest about the transatlantic slave trade around the town. And yes. uh, I think that's a valuable and important thing. And it sounds so trite that just a sign on the street matters, but it does because people visiting yeah. there, yeah. walking down this beautiful street go, wait a minute, that was a slave pen and it's right there. And that's important. Mm. So I think that that's yeah. studied more. I think that it needs to be just a more upfront reality of this is what it was, right? And having that there. So I would say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, and I, yeah, and I think uh, I mean, yeah, shit, we can talk about this and 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 you know, ruffle some feathers, uh, <laughs> which I know that neither of us are terribly, uh, you know, uh, we, that we mind doing really. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, actually, the next question kind of ties into this too. It was basically saying. Are there are any sort of landmarks in New Orleans? They also said anywhere else, really, uh, uh, that maybe deserve kind of uh, more attention, or or that you sort of, you know, would uh, uh, that you guys want to talk about? And yeah, no, I've definitely noticed that too. So yeah, basically, it, it is really interesting, and this just kind of goes to show how much, you know, when you're like, how much kind of the media shapes kind of our understanding of these kind of weird kind of nebulous culture war things, um, and when you're kind of when you're not in a local bubble somewhere, yeah, just like how how much your information is just shaped by you know what Jesse Waters or or fucking you know Anderson Cooper is telling you, you know, it's but like they uh, tell you to think, right? Um, they pretty much homogenize the cultural conversation. Yeah, yeah, precisely. So, uh, but yeah, it's so we had you know in 2017, and I've made two videos about this, as you know, I'm sure uh, uh, pretty much all my my subscribers know about. Um, uh, you know, in 2017, we had this whole controversy with the Confederate monuments, uh, though, really, we only had the controversy with four of our Confederate monuments. There, you know, were and are more Confederate monuments in, in Orleans Parish. Um, but, uh, you know, so basically they voted, the city council voted to remove uh, Jeff Davis, Robert E. Lee, uh, P.T. Beauregard, our boy, and, uh, um, and, and uh, who else? Who was the other guy? Uh, Liberty Place, uh, which, you know, was a fucking... <laughs> <laughs> oh God, Liberty Place. Um, if ever a monument uh, deserved to come down, that it would be that one. Um, and uh, but yeah, so big, big controversy. National news had a bunch of people come down to protest the removal of these statues. Confrontations, you know, street fights. It was messy. It was messy. Um, and uh, you know, monuments were removed basically, and then you know, it was the story for a while, and then you know, the media lost interest. And the protesters went home, basically. Uh, as far as, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's, that, that, you know, there are people here in Orleans Parish who did not support removing the monuments. But, uh, you know, uh, and granted my kind of sample of, you know, I generally, like, am friends with young people, you know, uh, who I would imagine, like, skew more liberal. Though, you know, certainly not all my friends are liberal. But, you know, definitely they kind of skew that way. So I'd imagine my sample size might be, like, not terribly representative. But, you know, we are a very blue parish, uh, and it really just kind of seemed like everybody either really supported taking these monuments down or just didn't give a shit. Um, so, yeah, so basically a lot of these people who were protesting were from, from out of town, right? And, and sort of once the outrage machine kind of stopped whirling or at least kind of moved on to something else, people just kind of lost interest. Uh, however, <laughs> there were still Confederate monuments standing. Uh, Two of which actually were very close to the Jefferson Davis statue uh, that did get taken down. Was the site of protests and fights and you know and, and real and just you know just horrible nastiness you know, um, and uh, uh, one was uh, fuck uh, one was Albert Pike, a Confederate general. Uh, his statue is still up, um, and uh, and another one was uh, I don't remember the guy's name, some fucking Civil War expert I turned out to be, but he was the first Confederate officer killed 
in the whole Civil War in Charleston. Uh, uh, he got killed um, in 1861, and he was a New Orleanian. Um, so, you know, uh, I was, uh, you know, and, you know, I, I sort of just because I'm a history nerd, I just kind of noticed these monuments, you know, when I happened to pass by that street, right? It's just like, oh, there's old Alfred Pike, you know, or uh, Albert Pike, you know, and I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm the sort of person who notices this stuff. Most people clearly don't because these Confederate statues were just kind of sitting there, just completely ignored. Um, but because they weren't in the news, nobody gave a shit. And then uh, recently with the sort of most more recent monument controversy last summer, uh, the, the Pike statue got vandalized. Somebody put like a KKK hood on it. And the, uh, um, the other one of the first officer, uh, Confederate officer killed in the war, um, that one, you know, got, he got splattered with, with red paint, you know, to look like blood and, and, you know, somebody scrawled like slave owner on it or something like that. And, um, uh, and you know, nothing happened like, you know, for like a month, the graffiti just like stayed on there. Um, and then I noticed that the, that the city came around and, uh, and the Pike one, they didn't even clean up the graffiti. They just took off the hood. <laughs> and then for the other one, uh, nothing happened. And then, you know, one day I'm driving down the street and then it's just gone. Like the city did not take it down. The pedal's still still there. Somebody just came by, picked up <laughs> the bust, threw it in the back of their truck or whatever and drove away. <laughs> like clearly somebody just took it, you know? And wasn't in the news, not even the local news. Nobody gave a shit. Um, and, you know, and, and it, it does, I don't know, it's just kind of very ironic to me that when you have all, you know, whenever it's on Fox News, you have people coming out of the woodwork pre pretending to care about these priceless works of art. But when it's not in the news and it happens, it's just kind of like, eh, whatever. Like you said, the outrage like, machine. It's, like, it's interesting when we talk about this yeah. because at Liberty Place, that when, when you start to learn the reality of at least, I think that was the first one to go. Um, when, um, yeah, when, it was. Which it definitely deserved to be. When people start talking about these things, I think that when you see the media and talking about just Confederate monuments or whatever, um, yeah. there needs to be more context around what some of these monuments actually are and were. And your video was really good yeah. at doing that. Liberty Place, yeah. if you don't know is it a terrible example it's not even a confederate monument it's really about a white lynch mob killing people um hooray yeah yeah um, yeah. yeah so yeah. that that statue that monument was horrendous now of the statues that were moved i gotta say one of the ones i think that i would have some difference to was the one for beauregard because i think what would have been mm. better with beauregard would have been to leave the statue would put up a interpretive plaque because beauregard mm. in his time in the war versus how he acted after the war i'm not saying he's an upstanding like woke person but when you saw what no, he I did got you, yeah. what he did after the war was quite different than what he did during the war during mm -hmm. the war he absolutely yeah. for, fought for slavery um but after the mm -hmm. war he decided well we lost we have to work together now let's see what we can do and that would have been an interesting way to look at history and have it be more palpable in that people can yeah. change and Beauregard kind of was an example of that yeah he absolutely was yeah it was just kind of interesting you know how how Beauregard kind of underwent that shift and yeah I mean that is sort of the and, and I have talked to uh um, uh, to, to historians, you know, not just, you know, two-bit entertainers like me, but historians who, who have advocated uh, exactly what you're saying, Carl, which is, you know, recontextualizing and stuff. And, you know, and I, I can, I can kind of see both sides, you know, because there is sort of an aspect, which I did talk about in that video, where it's like, you know, the monument of Beauregard, you know, even though Beauregard, the man, you know, was an intelligent dude and uh, did a lot of good specifically for the city of New Orleans. Like, you know, uh, after the war. I mean, you know, he, he improved our infrastructure. He did a lot of great things for the city um, that, you know, should be remembered, right? But, uh, you know, the, that monument specifically was not put up to remember those things. You know, it was not put up to remember his record as a civil rights activist. It was, you know, it's him on a horse in gray, you know, I'm gonna go kill some Yankees, you know. So like, and, and, and that's, you know, what so many of those statues were put up for as propaganda, you know. Um, and so that's sort of a, I can sort of see the sort of side of that that would be like, you know what, this is, doesn't, we, this doesn't have any place. This like just propaganda on public display just like doesn't have any place in modern New Orleans because that's, those aren't our values. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, but yeah, at the same time, you know, kind of painting it, painting him with this broad brush of just like, okay, so... 
and I, I don't think it's necessarily sort of speaks to the statue more as just kind of remembering him and how we sort of interpret history surrounding Beauregard, right? Painting him with this broad brush of just like, and you know, and frankly, most Confederates, you know? And I think, you know, some of my more kind of uh, 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 vehement uh, Sherman posting fans uh, would do well to take note that uh, sort of painting all Confederates with this broad brush of, you know, oh, they fought for slavery, fuck them is kind of a mistake, you know, because there is, yes, they did fight for slavery, and yes, we are kind of dealing with uh, the fallout of generations of the lost cause myth, you know, dominating Civil War memory in this country, and we need to push back against that. I mean, shit, you know, I understand that. Of course I do. Uh, but that said, you know, when you just sort of say there's nothing about these, you know, that there, there's, there's nothing about, we can't see ourselves in these men. We can't see ourselves in these people. They're just too far gone. They're so different from us that, that we, that we just cannot empathize with them at all, or sort of try to understand things from their point of view. Um, I mean, that's like trying to open a can of SpaghettiOs with a sledgehammer, you know, uh, it's just, you're just not gonna, you know, you're, you're, you're overcorrecting too far in the opposite direction. The statue was absolutely him, like you said, in the Confederate gray going to kill the Yankee, but that's an interesting, showing that juxtaposition from what was then to what he became is um, humanizing. And I think that that's important. I think yeah. that's what you're touching on this with what you're talking about, or you're not touching on it. You're saying it. When we when we turn all of historical features and all the historical characters and all the things that have happened in history into just simple cardboard cutouts, we lose the reality of them being human beings. And yeah. while I think there is a core principle of morality that doesn't change over time, I think the idea of, in context, well, in context, the Holocaust was always bad, right? There's no yeah. moral law that says, like, well, in context, no. There's no moral yeah, yeah, argument yeah. that's okay. But dehumanizing people, even people involved in such things, makes it seem like they're not us. And that's the risk because they are us. And if we don't yeah. realize they're us, exactly. that's how we don't prevent it from happening again. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree more. And, and yeah, I mean, I'm not a moral relativist. You know, I do think that, that there is, you know, there is right and wrong in the world. And what it generally boils down to is, you know, you being empathetic and compassionate toward other people, you're in the right. Are you being a fucking selfish piece of shit? You're wrong. You know, it's like totally. But to the... me, it's like it's not that complicated. You know, and and yeah, and even you know, in context, you know, we're talking about the Confederacy, even in context in 1860s, you know, in, in developed nations, slavery was you know a uh, was widely regarded by just about everybody, uh, you know, except Southerners and Brazilians, uh, as being this. Uh, you know, really quite unspeakable moral evil, you know. Uh, um, but yeah, and even, you know, and, and yeah, so we talk about slavery or the Holocaust, but there's, you know, less dramatic uh, sort of examples as well that, that are kind of equally uncomfortable uh, and that were around for a very long time. I mean, you know, marrying off your daughter at 12, that kind of thing. It's, it's where, uh, you know, it was the norm for millennia. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, and, you know, and, and that's, I mean, shit, you know, I mean, it's, it's that is just utterly repugnant from where I'm sitting, you know, in 2021. Uh, yeah, and, you know, but there is sort of a cultural context that you do need to keep in mind. But like, let's just use the slaveholder example because we're on it because it's relevant to yeah. what we're talking about. There were, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to not think that a lot of people that were slaveholders didn't know somewhere back here that this was not mm. cool, that it wasn't right. Yeah. But what's more interesting yeah. is not the question about the cardboard cutout version of that, but how did they convince themselves to get to the point that they were okay with it? That's the question I would rather yeah. ask. And that's the one I'd like to figure yes. out the answer about. And if, if we're human about it, we would realize that all of us can convince ourselves of something like that. And that's the question. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, yeah, and I think that's very evident. If you just kind of read between the lines, it's very evident, uh, that sort of stuff, in their actual justifications of it, you know? Is that, uh, and, and that's uh, very often... Um, Kind of what they would talk about is there were religious justifications, there were scientific justifications, um, you know, there there was sort of the pseudo scientific kind of justifications, twisted. the little bump on yes. the skull, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's you know, yeah, exactly. Let's not mince words. They were pseudo scientific, uh, but yeah, and and uh, you know, there were appeals to empathy. You know, like oh, you know, it's 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 actually the the kind thing. You know, is keeping my slave is, is a kind thing, you know, um, and, and that's sort of interesting because, you know, when you sort of started to see that kind of those sorts of justifications for slavery arising in 
sort of early America, that of course was a reaction to the growing abolitionist movement and the growing anti-slavery movement and people saying, wait, no, isn't this really just pretty atrocious, you know, and, and people wouldn't be writing books and they did write books. People wouldn't be writing books defending slavery if there wasn't some sort of attack on it. You know, you take a look at uh, um, a lot of people's uh, aversion to vegans. Um, you know, like like it's it, that there is sort of, you know, when, when vegans say, yeah, you really shouldn't eat meat, it's immoral, and it's also horrible for the environment, and it's bad in every single way, and, and, this, and here's why, X, Y, and Z. You know, uh, certainly, you know, my first reaction to those arguments was like, Oh, what do you mean? No, fuck you. You're wrong. I like eating meat and it tastes good and, and I want to do it. You know, <laughs> that's, like, that's not a fucking argument. And you see, you, you used to see a lot of similar arguments being made. Um, like, uh, uh, yeah, there was one, uh, I was researching this, the last uh, Check My Lincolnites episode that I made. And, um, uh, and there was a, uh, I, was, I was reading this book by this guy, Kevin Levin. It's uh, called Searching for Black Confederates. It was like my main source for that video. Um, and there was a, I mean, it's, it would be funny if it, if it wasn't so tragic. And it is a little funny. But like, there was this one Confederate who was talking about bringing one of his slaves to war. And he was writing to, writing home or whatever. And he said something like, oh, well, you know, why would I do any work if I could have someone else do it for me? And that was, that was his whole justification. You know, it was like, well, uh, I don't want to work. <laughs> the law says it's okay, so it must be fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When I hear that, it's like when you look at the founding fathers, like this is a gross, gross simplification. But Thomas Jefferson, wow, we know we really shouldn't have slavery. Let's do something about that after I'm dead. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's really exactly. a gross simplification, but it's kind of the truth. Weird question. Yes, Lewis H., it is a weird question. I don't know why you would ask such a weird question. Very weird. Uh, but something I'm curious about, one of the things I immediately think of when I hear New Orleans is the voodoo religion. Was there a significant voodoo culture in New Orleans in the Civil War or Reconstruction era, or did it uh, not become more prominent until later? Also, if it was significant, did it lead to many clashes with the majority white Christian population? Um, or Protestant Christian, white Protestant Christian. So, uh, well, that's, that's sort of the, the, the thing, though, Lewis, is that uh, in New Orleans, uh, there's never been a majority Protestant uh, city, you know? Uh, it is very Catholic. And voodoo is itself uh, a byproduct of Catholicism. Um, it's not, you can't really separate it uh, uh, that distinctly from it. I mean, what voodoo is, it, it's not a... A transplanted West African belief system so much as it is a melding of West African and uh, European religious traditions. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, I've talked about this in one, you know, uh, uh, New Orleans history video or another, but yeah, I mean, it's, you have certain kind of similarities between these spiritual traditions from these two continents, you know, like uh, uh, the belief in, like a monotheistic belief, you know, monotheistic uh, uh, um, uh, belief system. You have um, uh, the idea of the saints and of the uh, loas, which I believe how it's pronounced, which is the, you know, a, a kind of West African ancestor spirit that you, you know, you pray to a specific one to get a specific result, you know, and it's, and, you know, very similar to how saints function in Catholicism. So, when, um, you know, when West Africans were forcibly brought over here, uh, they were forced to convert and then they simply incorporated kind of their own belief systems into uh, Catholicism. And that's that is how voodoo originated. Yeah, I, I would. I, I, that's something that this one really I love this question because it's something I'm personally interested in, because like in the. Um... So, so Vodan, like you said, came from, from West Africa, but then when it got to New Orleans, it syncretized with, with Catholicism and became just like you described, a New Orleanian version thereof of voodoo, right? So, yeah. um, and yeah. so like when you think of, um, in Vodan, you have this, uh, one of the Loas, Papa Legba, who's this entity or the a spirit that opens the crossroads. He's the one that opens the gate to talk to the ancestors or the other Loa. And that became syncretized with St. Peter. <laughs> uh, and, mm. and so yeah. since yeah, exactly. those two could work together, it was very common for someone, uh, to be both. Now, they wouldn't necessarily be very open about being a Vudan practitioner because it would be possible that uh, someone of Catholic origin or their Catholic master might not shine on that yeah. too well. But like when you see yeah, Marie yeah. Laveau, one of the most, if not the most famous practitioners in New Orleans, she was both yep. part of the parish. She was Catholic, but a powerful Vudan priestess. So 
absolutely syncretized and i think that's fascinating and it's still there in the city today not there's the tourist version and there's the real stuff and it's it's all yeah, still yeah, there exactly, now exactly. it's still there now i mean yeah like during the right time of the year you can go there and you can see still on um in in uh bayou saint john um sally saint john. Yeah, does right. her baptism um there for uh for for uh and so that's uh it's still there it's still alive this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, what do you think uh, of the future of university degrees uh, that can cost a minimum of fifty thousand dollars in four years to obtain in social science, when so many detailed topics of history are available for free in entertaining and informative ways on sites like YouTube, and often made by people without degrees in social science? I mean, you know, it's kind of a big topic. I mean, it, it, it touches on you know a lot of what we do. Um, what do you think? This is a tough one because I find that yeah. Okay, so I'll just put this out there. I don't have a college degree, so that's like I don't have one. So it is what it is. Um, before doing mm -hmm. what I do now, I was I still do some of this. I was an infosec guy doing firewalls, networks, encryption, and that all came out of just mm -hmm. skills and doing it. Um, so that yeah. said, um, I think the kind of stuff when we talk about when we talk about history and sociology and all the things that we touch upon here, even with topics in this video, um, it's dangerous to not have academia as part of it because it needs to be properly analyzed and reviewed yeah. and peer reviewed and it needs to have primary sources and all the research that comes with that and um these videos like what i do on in range at least give you at least i'm hoping to give a slightly different perspective on something because it hasn't been properly represented i think i think of it frequently as um intentionally induced amnesia it's like these are the historical topics that are mm, don't really fit our narrative we just kind of put them over there and that's the stuff that yeah, i find yeah, interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would not say what I do on a topic, even if it's one that maybe you've never heard of before, but you're like, oh my gosh, what that should be is a seed crystal to start going down a much deeper path if you really want to learn more. This is just the very scratching yeah. of the surface. So do I think that we you need to have do you need to have academic credentials to be a historian or sociologist? No. But do we need to have people that have those credentials? Yes. Yeah, I mean I am not and I'm I Try to be as upfront about this as I possibly can. I'm not a historian. I don't have a history degree. I am a self-taught historian. I am primarily an entertainer. Uh, what I am is I, you know, I, I'm an entertainer. I'm a documentarian I, who can, just kind of knows how to read academic uh, writings um, and, and sort of has, uh, has been sort of in that world for so long and has had the benefit of being... Uh, taught in some ways by like park rangers and by uh historian friends and you know i and i've it's obviously always been an interest for me but basically kind of what i do in my channel is academia hands me a pill i cover that pill in chocolate and then i sell it to you that's what i do how do you think the different languages um uh so what are our thoughts basically about the different languages uh, uh taught or spoken in America. Um, uh, they say, like, I remember that Louisiana had a strong French speaking population. How has that impacted uh, the United States? Well, I think it affects the culture, right? I think the language you think in actually is part of the way you perceive the world. People's different languages will say or try to say the same thing or express the same idea, but the way they express it based on how their language works is different. Um, so yeah. I think yeah. that that changes your perception of the world to a certain degree and the way you just work. So French might have yes. this way of seeing the world. And here in, in Arizona, we have, of course, a very um, Hispanic and Spanish influence. So that's another mm -hmm. way of view of the world. And these crucibles yeah. where these languages and cultures combine mean that they become special in that since language is how we explain ourselves and perceive, therefore we perceive that environment uniquely. Yeah. Uh, yes. Couldn't have put it better myself. Uh, yeah. I mean, specifically, you know, with the, with the question of, uh, about sort of French in Louisiana, um, uh, I mean, sadly, at least in, in New Orleans, people do speak, still speak French in, in Louisiana and there are French schools in New Orleans, uh, and stuff like that. But like, um, uh, but, but, but very sadly, about 100 years ago, there was actually a big, uh, uh, there was a lot of social pressure for the French speaking population of Louisiana to start, start speaking English. So you don't see it nearly as much as you used to, uh, which is, which is kind of too bad. In, in Cajun country, there's like the, the dialect or the accent of French is different than necessarily like Creole or city French. And it was considered gumbo French and it was not, uh, 
not understandable by anyone that actually spoke the proper language. But during World War II, mm -hmm. a lot of Cajuns landed up in the U.S. military forces and went to France. Turned out they did just fine, and they were great as translators. So um, yeah, this, yeah, like, yeah. they were just put down for speaking this weird dialect. And that's something we tend to do in, in humanity is like, oh, they're different, therefore they're lesser. There was nothing lesser yeah, about yeah, their yeah. language at all, and it worked just fine in France. So there's another example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that is really cool. Um, all right, uh, moving right along here. So, um, all right, so we've seen uh, my opinions on the movies Gods and Generals and Gettysburg, the Civil War movies. What are Carl's? I'm going to simply put a si simple sentence, to be honest, and it's probably going to get a lot of heat. Boring propaganda. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, honestly, I mean, I certainly, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I might defend Gettysburg a little bit more, but... Uh, I, I would say uh, that is yeah. better, yes, but I feel yeah. like both of them yeah. land up into that. Um, it, uh, if That's I were funny. to... Yeah. It's not perfect. None of these movies are perfect. If I were to pick yeah. two Civil War film items that I personally prefer, and you can differ with me, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. One is Glory. I think Glory is quite good. Um, and yeah, the yeah. other one is actually by... It was not a movie, but it was a documentary piece on the History Channel... Uh, I think it was an hour long, called Gettysburg. And it didn't deal with the politics oh, yeah. at all. It was strictly individual soldiers and their experience on the battlefield. I remember that. It was that exceptional. Was really good. It was yeah. really good. Yeah, that was like, what, like 2008? It was it was a while back now. But yeah, like the, the you know, costumes and the makeup and stuff and all the kind of uh, the, uh, yeah, the sort of uh, recreations and the footage, you know, it was like very cinematic and like looked great and uh, and was not glorifying the conflict one iota, you know? Like there was blood, there was guts, there was dirt, there was mud. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was I was a fan of that as well. Um, yeah, yeah, Gl Glory is a good movie. I mean, I, I don't want to sort of necessarily get too into that topic because yeah, I mean that's actually another one of my like most requested videos is reviewing Glory, which I'm not going to get around to. Oh, sorry, time, I just triggered your audience for but, tons of comments. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's okay. Uh, but uh, uh, no, that's all right. Um, uh, but yeah, of course, you know, us talking about Glory in a positive way, people will say that's union propaganda. Uh, even though it portrays the Union as... Uh, not that know, great. As not that great. Okay, um, here's the last one. <laughs> All right, last <laughs> question. End. This has been... Um, these Q&As always go long. I'm sorry, but man, this uh, is great. No, no, I'm just it's, loving it's this totally conversation. Uh, so, um, question is, I frequently see important groups of people being discarded or minimized uh, in the context of a narrative or discussion because their views clash with a modern idea or moral. Uh, it's kind of, we sort of already touched on this, but this might be an interesting sort of perspective here. Uh, what are your thoughts on removing certain figures from the historical narrative because they uh, held belief at the time that we considered to be racist or problematic? How should we consider the broader context of the time when we speak about historical figures and movements? One thing we sort of didn't talk about a little earlier is sort of, I guess, cutting to the meat, I think, of the question, which is, uh, you know, should we, and I've talked about, I think, in a, in a Q and A video in the past. It's like, should we judge historical figures figures by modern standards or not? Um, you know, again, like it's there's no right answer to that, and it's up to you. And I'll probably look back at some of my opinions that I hold right now, and realize they were questionable. Like it's going to happen. We're going to. That's yeah. part of the human thing. I think we've talked about so much about in this video, is that. Um, uh, perception is so much what we're based around in the society we live in at the time and therefore as we learn more and, and start to understand the context of the world we lived in versus the world we're living in uh, perception yeah. could very well change now that doesn't change certain basic fundamental moral laws for me and that's one of the things that I have a struggle with in this regard like you could use the argument of moral relativism to say well the Nazis thought they were doing the right thing and that's the weirdest and creepiest thing of all is that they probably did think they were doing the oh, right yeah. thing oh without um, a freaking doubt yeah yeah very few people are like i'm gonna go out and do horrible shit they generally think yeah. they're doing the right thing and um yeah. in fact that's a real interesting conversation i had when i was doing more of my information security work there's this organization called infraguard and it's a it's an uh aggregate of both uh essentially private and public sector information security work and there was an fbi agent that she was giving us a presentation and she said, you know what I've never heard from anyone I've ever had to prosecute for doing awful things? I've never heard any of them said saying that they were bad or evil or wrong. They thought they were doing something yeah. good. And or for the most part thought they were doing something right. Like and so when we look back at history, we see all these historical figures that have done some really terrible things. There are definitely some ex exceptions that were just sociopaths that knew they were doing awful things and didn't care. John Wesley Harding, yeah, yeah. I think, would be an example as a gunslinger. But um Yeah, definitely. That said, most of these people thought they were doing the right thing. Uh, the Nazis thought they were doing the right thing. But when we look at it, we have to realize the certain basic fundamental moral law, for my 
way of looking at the world is there's no way to justify certain acts and their acts are no way ever yeah. justifiable even if they thought they're doing the right thing so when it comes to yeah, relativism exactly. about historical uh, events and people i think that we need to look at them in all of the context of what they've done and were they able to learn and change over time Beauregard mm. we spoke about became a different person than when he was fighting for the confederacy but that mm. doesn't necessarily take away from if here's a question if the war had gone the other way and the confederacy won would Beauregard have changed I don't know, right? That woo, yeah, that's a probably that's a, not. That's a tough question. Yeah. And so therefore yeah. I think moral relativism based on historical norms is dangerous and slippery and we have to put it yeah. into context of where we are at now and that what you said this earlier in this basically treating other human beings with dignity, empathy and respect if you're not doing that you're wrong and that's where I draw the line. Yeah. 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 So that's my take. Uh, I th very well put. And I, I think that's a, that's a great place uh, to end my section of this Q&A video. Um, apologize if we didn't get to all of your questions, but we just kind of got away from, you know, we just kind of got, uh, got carried away uh, just chatting and shooting the shit. But uh, yeah, there's going to be another kind of segment of this over on Carl's channel, uh, which I will link in the description below, guys. <laughs> um, anyway. Usually I end uh, these Q&As with a, a joke, but uh, I can't really think of one, so.